Fram för skönning för dig, men se vad det är med drag, vet ni, för att det är inte så. I det länkar ur för mig kan ni ju mer för drag. Så hoppelig att det skulle vara allmål där om gemakkelijk, det är inte vad det är gewoond. Det är en privilege för oss denna morgon att vara worshipping en awesome god, som vi bara sang om. Och du kommer att finna ut mer about his awesomeness as we go this morning. You need to open your Bibles to Psalm 119. It's just a word of prayer. Father, we thank you the opportunity we have again of looking into your word and our dependence is upon your Holy Spirit who originally inspired all of these concepts may it be that we as your children will understand and appreciate and, begin and love your word more and more so that we can live it out to your honor. Amen. This, this is the longest psalm and if you have had time to go through it, and those of you who have actually thought of persevering with it, many people read the first couple of verses and they give up and they say, ah, oh, these are all the same. But if you read it carefully, you will notice that they're not all the same. Psalm 119 is famous for many things. And one of the things that it's extremely famous for, most people might not know of. If you, some of you might be too young to remember Brother Andrew, the God smuggler, who used to smuggle in Bibles into Russia. When you want to do something daring, you convert a folksy into a Bible carrying car to get into Russia and or China. And in the particular case how this arrived is quite fascinating because it's really the Chinese Christians who got a hunger for the Word of God obviously only from the power of the Holy Spirit that drove them to want to get hold of Bibles. Because to not have a Bible it doesn't make too much sense to us today because we actually buy Bibles that are printed in China and delivered here. Cheaper than what we can do the printing here. But in those days getting all of a Bible in China was almost impossible. And that's why Brother Andrew got onto this idea of smuggling Bibles in. Now, I don't know how many Bibles she's smuggling, but this is where the beauty of the story comes. These people had such a hunger for the Word of God. They used to stand in long queues to come and get a Bible because that was under control as to who gets what Bible. First of all, you have to be a believer. I imagine if you stand in a long queue for a long time, regularly you're a believer. Almost like you people are here hungry for the word. And what was so fascinating about this was that he could only deliver, I don't know how many. You guys might be able to guess better than I am. But they weren't the biggest Bibles, they weren't study Bibles, they weren't complicated Bibles. But they were able to give uh, Bibles that the people would hand out. Now, here comes the next part of the beauty of the, the determined Christian. They had to qualify, besides saying I'm a Christian, they had to be able to uh, repeat what they had learned from the Psalm 119. They had to quote it to whoever they were going to pick up the Bible from. Have you 
try to memorize 119 and you got 175 verses and when you read it in the English it's fairly close to each other but the beauty of the psalm is as Spurgeon says as Matthew Henry says as Calvin says there's not a verse in that chapter that is the same that has any duplication so the writing of it is incredible of course it's incredible because the holy spirit inspired it and we can have the privilege of looking at this today because it is truly really something that we should hang on to and get excited about and and pick up certain parts of it now obviously we can't do this whole thing today because you know we're not chinese we can't sit around for a few days we're going to do a short part of it and try and encourage you to get excited about the Word of God. And Spurgeon actually called it the Sacred Ode is a little Bible. The Scriptures condensed rewritten in holy emotion and action a garden of sweet flowers now when Spurgeon gets carried away he often describes this in marvelous words and if I can recommend anything other than reading this directly and learning it for yourself if you need a commentary get out of Spurgeon's commentary I would suggest the uh, the old one is still a little bit uh, not so easy to understand in fact but there's a modern one that came out which the um, banner of truth no, well, crossway sorry they put it out in two volumes in more modern english and it's very more under understandable and spurgeon actually did this Psalm in, in, in 50, 55, uh, sorry, 75 pages for just the, this one uh, psalm. 119 takes up so much. The whole of the psalms takes up two volumes. And Spurgeon wasn't somebody who was shy to say what he wanted to say. It's powerful, it helps you understand better. But in our understanding and what we want to encourage you to do is to learn to depend upon the Holy Spirit in teaching you the Word of God. That means you've got to read the Bible yourself. You've got to understand it. But it doesn't mean that you don't have to use commentaries. But be careful what commentaries you use because you might find yourself getting into all sorts of very poor commentaries, very poor uh, doctrine. So if you still got to buy one, remember just to check out what you're going to get when you do that. you find as you apply your mind, body, soul, your heart, it develops an inward delight captivate your mind more and more is what we are encouraged to do by those who know the psalm as Spurgeon said no spiritual exercise is more profitable to the soul than devout meditation I have to clear for you the word meditation this morning and I hope that this is not going to get you confused with the transcendental meditation that takes place in various eastern countries and that might be why a lot of people are discouraged by it we find that this meditation story is covered throughout the western world people are using meditation as a, some sort of a cure for the 
problems that they might be having, the depression they might be experiencing, but not for real Christian spiritual growth. And you find that a lot of them are using the to do the religions in the East, coming in with Hinduism and other various teachings that have no value for a Christian. To give you an idea of what the uh, meditation should contain, one of the uh, definitions I found, I tried, there were a whole lot available, but I tried to pick one that wouldn't be too complicated. It's a holy exercise. This is what um, Watson says, Puritan Watson. Holy, it's a holy exercise of the mind whereby we bring the truth of God to remembrance and to seriously ponder upon them and apply them to ourselves. That's a definition. There are many definitions that we could use. But what you'll see, you'll get a better idea from the word that we're going to read now. If you look at your Bible, keep it open. And the Afrikaans Bible, the vertaling is baie goed met hierdie so, hou dit open, sien of jy woorde kan identificeer wat vir jou baie betekenis vol is in die Afrikaans. But in the English, we start at verse 1, we're going to do a few verses that we're going to cover in particular to understand the beauty of this song. Reading from verse 1, Blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep His testimonies, who seek Him with their whole heart. And I would like to, us to bear that word heart in mind. When we think about a definition, we're going to see that we'll develop another definition to include the heart and the mind. Verse 3, who also do no wrong, but walk in his ways. You have commanded your precepts to be kept diligently. Oh, that my ways may be steadfast in keeping your structures. Then I shall not be put to shame, having my eyes fixed on all your commandments. I will praise you with an upright heart when I learn your righteous rules. I will keep your statutes. Do not utterly forsake me. How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandment. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Up to there so far, I just want to emphasize the point that in... Um, the Psalm 119, 14, not 119, sorry, Psalm 19, 14 is a word that you should keep handy or in your heart. Now, what I'm getting at here is I had trouble memorizing, and I still have trouble memorizing this long one, 119, and I don't know if I'll live so long to get through it. But in the meantime, there are many of those verses in that chapter that are beautiful and able to be a blessing to us. But now, just to give you a verse to hang on to that I've used for many a time, which balances out with this long one we're going to do. Psalm 19.14. One of those verses you can use Put it in your heart. 
and I'm trying to get you to be able to think in those terms. If it goes into your heart, it's going to be a delight. If it's just in your brain, you might have difficulty with it. Now think of it this way. Let the words of my mouth, it says, and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. I have an automatic switch. It's the only automatic switch I have in my mind. Only one I can operate. I was there on the counter and on the computer. I don't know which button to press. But this verse has been established in my mind. When I see a problem occurring, I say, if I see somebody walking into the shop, where well, I used to, I don't, I'm not in the shop anymore, but when I was in the shop, and I saw somebody walking there looking like they can attack on me like one of those guys from the rugby team. And I'm thinking, whoa, this person looks like they got a problem. I don't try and defend myself and start thinking, hey, I better be nice and charming to this person. This text comes to my mind. That the word... Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart. Now listen to this. Be acceptable, not to this guy that's walking in there. Not to my neighbor that's going to have a fight with me. Not to my, I was going to say my wife, but she doesn't fight with me. <laughs> you might find this with other situations. Brothers and sisters and family quite often give you a challenge. You say that the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Who's the your? God. It must be acceptable in God's sight. O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer. That's who we're talking to. This is why this has been such a beautiful anchor in my heart that I know I can, I can in fact repeat it. I can even sometimes answer the phone. I used to do that. I am anticipating a bad phone call. And before I pick it up, may the words of my heart and the meditation, meditation of my mind be acceptable unto you, O Lord, my God. And just think of that. Instead of, I hope I can answer this guy that's going to phone me now. Have you guys got that order ready? Those things are going through your mind and you're in a state of panic before you even pick up the phone. Whereas if I'm talking to the Lord to keep my words acceptable to Him, I am far more relaxed. And he's going to help me answer this person. And I can kind of remember all the times that has been helpful in my heart and mind. I think the customer can hear, this guy's relaxed. He's not lying. He's relaxed. And he's going to be able to communicate with me. He's going to be able to communicate with you because you're, you have an advocate. He doesn't know about it. Imagine going to your custom every time with your human advocate standing behind you. This is my guy. He's going to do the talking. Whereas in this Christian guideline that we have here, there is the one verse I'm talking about. But this, verse, this chapter we're referring to here has many a verse that can help you to calm you and give you answers for situations. And that's why when we get to this verse that I've stopped at here, verse 16, with my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I have stored up in stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. That's what we're trying to do here from our point of view. We know that we need help to avoid sinning. Otherwise, before we know it, 
we're done in lies. And our sins are coming out as fast as we can keep control of it. But if we're praying this prayer in our heart, we're not going to lie. Because when we lie to this person, we're lying to God. He knows what you're saying. And your advocate is with you. Bear in mind that we're talking about the triune God, the Holy Spirit who wrote this word. As we, the spirit of holiness, as we sang just now, gives you that clear impression what you're dependent upon, the holiness of the Holy Spirit. The other beautiful thing about this verse, I have stored up your word in my heart. That's why we have to work on this meditating that we're going, that I'm trying to encourage you to do of the word of God. Stored up is an improvement on the old words that they used to use. Even the English has improved as they've rewritten it each time. In the, in the past they used to say, I've hidden your word in my heart. Now hidden sounds to me like you don't want anybody to see it. And it's something you're going to lose somewhere along the line. You're going to look for it. I'm forever losing and dropping things. I find it. I don't want to hide things. I want to know where to find them. And now the new translations, this one, the, the NIV's got uh, stored. But the beautiful thing I learned not long ago, when this Afrikaans new translation came out, I suddenly decided I'd have a look at it see how they've translated it and they've got an excellent word there Akuster your word in my heart and I just thought that was absolutely what we need we need to treasure and some of the new translations in English have actually got that they say I have treasured your word in my heart. In other words, that's something you want to keep. That's something you're excited about. That's something you're not somewhere going to lose and forget so easily. You've got it there in your heart. So when you're learning the word of God, remember, when you're learning it, you're storing up, you're treasuring God's word. And that's what the one of the Puritans have told us to, I think it might be Watson as well, but he wants to get you to remember, when you're reading the Word of God, just think about it. Each word you're reading there is a word from God to you. This is not somebody else that's sending you this. This is a word that's been written by God through His Holy Spirit for you, to you, so that you can use it. Does it give you an idea that you should maybe read this? It's from God, the creator of all things, who created man, who knows man, who knows how to be your God, has written this, and he wrote it to you. Get that in your mind and your heart and you'll see how exciting that this word can become. Read it, you'll read it differently. You'll be more excited about it. I had a friend in the army. In the army we used to get post from home. Back in those days when they still had post and, and they delivered the post there to the, office and the uh, camp. And the guys were so excited about going to get a letter. Maybe they even got a, a box of biscuit or whatever pitched up. <laughs> this is what they were looking forward to. But we had a friend there in the army. He was just uh, engaged to be married just before he came in for nine months training. And he was still so in love with this woman. He couldn't wait to get the next letter. And the boy, between the two of them, it was almost like a daily thing. They kept the post office running. And he used to get his letter 
and he would go and drop down on his bed there and he would read that like it was a Bible. He would just go over it and over it and over it. And he was so excited about it. And I thought, of, you know, that's how we should be <laughs> reading the Word. When we find, oh, we've got a gap. We've got a time here to read the Word and read this exciting message that He has given to us. And as you're reading this psalm, you will find Time and time again, these beautiful, delightful words of God. Now I'm bringing in the word delightful because you'll see it comes in as we go along. That was verse 11. I'm reading all of these so that you can, I don't, just give you a taste of other things that are also beautiful. I can't give them all a commentary today, but we'll give you a few. Blessed, that's verse 12. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips I declare all the rules of your mouth. In the way of your testimony I delight as much as in all riches. As much as in all riches. You remember when we were doing Ephesians, are we still doing Ephesians, by the way? There's a clear message there, which God, and we have in, in, in Ephesians 3, where it says, all the riches of God. Um, the, those unsearchable, uh, as the words are written there, unsearchable. God's extraordinary provision God has made. The unsearchable riches of Christ, you and me to meditate upon. That's what it says in Ephesians. And yeah, we're getting the, the delight as much as of all riches. In other words, he's saying, I get so excited about this. This is really excites me because there's nothing no riches that can actually make me get so excited about the matter look at the next two verses Ephesians 15 and 16 I will meditate upon your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways I will delight in your statutes I will not forget your word you can see when you get into the situation where you find the Word of God delightful, where you get excited about it, you, you find the meaning begins to become real to you. And once that starts happening, more and more, you'll find that there is nothing else in this world that can hold your attention your love draw you, attract you to what God is giving us here. There is no greater communicator than God the Creator. He who will enlarge your heart. And that is a prayer we have to do. Like David prays, enlarge my heart, O oh God. You're going to need a larger heart. You're not going to get a heart burn. You're going to get a heart that is so excited about what's going on in the Word here that you just want more and more. And that understanding that comes to you through this Word, through God's Word, which He wrote. When did He write it? When did He start writing it? Before the foundation of the world. Can you even think of this? A letter written before the foundation of the world was already being processed so that you now, born 1960, whatever, 70, 80, that letter is now here with you. Many of us are blessed to have 
these Bibles. Bear in mind, you need to take the Bible you've got seriously. I don't know what you've got, what translation you've got, whether I can give you advice there or not. But I can be sure that the Bibles that are being printed, there are various versions. Some of them you might have to change your mind about. Once you grow in the Word of God, you're going to say, oh, there's something wrong with this. You might want to check it out, and if it's not right, get another one. But there are, very, there are quite a lot of good ones. Well done translations that you can just absorb. And I can tell you, originally, going back a long time, when I first got excited about the Word of God, I was a youngster. I could hardly read it. And my brother said to my father, we need to get him a Bible so he can read it. I could, I could hardly read anything else besides comics. And they organized this Bible for me. You never know where these things come from. My father was in the war in, in, in Egypt where they were fighting against uh, Germany. And he got a Bible. And he came from Scotland to South Africa to fight for South Africa against the Germans in Egypt. And then they gave him all those guys' Bibles. They were about this size, quite thick. And they used to wear it inside their coats. Some of them believed it was protection for their heart. There were some stories about how bullets saved their lives, but I don't know how many of those were true stories. But the true story was, I got that Bible. And that was the first Bible I started reading. Like, like I say, I couldn't read too well in those days. I still don't read too well, but I'm blessed because I love reading it. Like a little child has learned to read. And that's what happens with, this, with the Word. You read this Word over and over and you begin to see. And that's how this psalm has become for me. It has become more and more beautiful as I come. But here comes the verse I want to get you to see. Verse 18. I pray, open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things of your law. I am a sojourner on this earth. Hide not your commandments from me. My soul is consumed with <coughs> longing for your rules and at all times. That word, those words there, I am a sojourner on this earth. <laughs> I've almost finished my journey, but I'm enjoying it. And it's beginning more and more exciting. I'm not going to have a curtain close behind me when I leave that's going to leave me sad. I know where I'm going. My journey is nearly close, but I'm near, nearer to God. And if I go tomorrow, what a blessing. We can look forward to that. And that's what the Word of God teaches me. Time and time again, I'm learning of the beauty. A few more verses. My soul is consumed with longing with your rules at all times. You rebuke the insolent, accursed ones who wander from your commandments. Take away from me scorn and contempt, for I have kept your testimonies, even though princes sit plotting against me. Your servant will meditate on your statutes, your testimonies, are my delight. They are my counsellors. My meditation is my delight. I'm going to finish off with a few things I want you to spot. Just go over. We're not going to do the whole chapter. Relax. Verse 33. Look what happens here. Um... 
Rumbus. No, sorry. Jumped while I was wanting to teach. I've already covered the verse that I want to f just give you instead of what I was going to give you. Verse 15 and 16 again. There are three walls in that. Three walls. I will meditate on your precepts. I will and fix my eyes on your way. I will delight in your statutes and I will not forget your word. If that's all you remember of this text today, remember those three words. I will. You say that. When you read your word, when you pray, when you meditate upon God's word, keep those in your mind. I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. Meditate and delight on the word of God and it will go well with your soul. Rightly handle the word of truth. That is this word that we have in front of us. Bear in mind that it is God's word to you. When you're reading, each time you're reading, my Father has written to me. I need to focus on what he has written to me. Now, Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you for the fact that you've written it. It is your word. It cannot be anything but beautiful, wonderful, heartwarming, teaching us how to live and how to praise you and how to honor you. And might it become more and more delight to each one of us as we learn it and share it with others to your honor and glory. Amen.